Good morning, Lee University family. Thank you for logging in to Virtual Chapel today. We are so thankful that so many students and faculty have been joining us on Tuesdays and Thursdays during this time, and it's been great to see so many alums and parents joining us as well. This morning, our message is going to be brought to us from the president of Lee University, Dr. Paul Kahn. One of the things I appreciate so much about his leadership is the importance that he's placed on the chapel experience for our students. Dr. Khan is a great communicator, but he always brings his heart. So this morning, let's prepare ourselves to hear God's word from Dr. Khan's heart. Today, we also have a special worship leader. While he was a student in 2015, he went on to win season nine of The Voice. Let's join Jordan Smith and his wife, Kristen, in their home in Kentucky for a time of worship this morning. Hey, Lee University, it's Jordan Smith here with my wife, Kristen, and we're so thrilled to join you for this morning's online chapel. We know we can't be together in person, but we always love worshiping with our Lee family, and we pray that wherever you are, the Spirit of God would bring you strength and peace and comfort during this season. Let's worship together. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. Oh, my God will never fail. I'm going to see a victory, I'm going to see a victory, for the battle belongs to the Lord. I'm going to see a victory, I'm going to see a victory, for the battle belongs to you, Lord. Oh, oh, oh. There's power in the mighty name of Jesus. Every war he wages, he will win. I'm not backing down from any giant. Cause I know how this story is. Yes, I know how this story is. And I'm going to see a victory, I'm going to see a victory, for the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory, I'm going to see a victory, for the battle belongs to you, Lord. Oh. Worship my way through this battle. Gonna worship my way through. Ooh, yeah. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Yeah. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You're turning it around, God. You take what the enemy meant for evil. And you turn it for good, you turn it for good, oh, you take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good, you turn it for good, oh, you take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good, you 
turn it for good. And I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Whoa. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Oh, yes, this battle belongs to you, Lord. It belongs to you, God. Ooh, oh, for the battle belongs to you, God, I look to you, I won't be overwhelmed. Give me vision to see things like you do. God, I look to you, you're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom, you know just what to do, and I will love you.
We're so grateful for your presence. We're so grateful for everything that you mean to us. And today, we just bring all of our anxieties to you. We bring all of our worries to you. Everything that burdens us, we just come and lay it at the foot of the cross. Lord, I pray for strength and peace and healing and comfort and joy for the students that are watching today. Lord, we love you and we thank you so much for your love and your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everybody. It's 1040 on Thursday morning, and at Lee, that means it's chapel time. So even though Lee is scattered all over the world these days, we're still having chapel at the regular time, and I really am glad you tuned in, whether you're tuning in live with us now or at some later time. Uh, let me remind you to stay with that schedule I know Zoom is a pain in the neck. Uh, nobody ever claimed it was as good as the real thing, but I really do appreciate your sticking with it and working hard to, to make this um, Zoom situation work. And also, if you stay with the schedule of events that you see that are coming to you from, from Lee, these chapels at regular chapel times and other events and other things that you see advertised that come up on uh, video that you can see, uh, on your computer or uh, handheld device back home. Let me rem remind you of a couple of things. The Q&A sessions, the P. Cook, P. Con sessions uh, that we've been doing are going to continue next week at two o'clock on Monday. So uh, we're gonna keep doing these as long as you've got questions. So there's still questions coming in. So next Monday at two o'clock. And let me remind you that we will answer your questions either uh, on camera or in some other way, if you send it in to uh, studentfeedback at leeuniversity.edu. Send us any kind of question. If it's personal or you need a personal answer, somebody will answer you. If it's something that we can do on camera, that's what we'll do. So thanks for being a part of that. Another thing let me mention, I, I mentioned on this week's Q&A that some people have asked us, could we continue these chapels even after April 28, which is the last regularly scheduled chapel time? And the answer is, well, we could and we will if we really feel like enough people want us to. So give us your opinion on that. The last regular chapel of our semester schedule is April 28. We'll have that chapel. And then uh, we'll have a, you know, we'll have a hiatus for uh, final exams, but yeah, we could continue to do chapels during the month of May, maybe once a week, maybe once every two weeks, but whatever. The main thing is we want to hear from you. If you think it would mean something to you, of course we'll do it. So chime in on that and let us hear from you. Now, you know, I want to talk to you from the most familiar passage, one of the most familiar passages in God's Word. I would think undoubtedly the most familiar passage in the Old Testament is the 23rd Psalm. All of us memorized the 23rd Psalm when we were kids. There's one single four-word phrase in the 23rd Psalm I want to talk about because it's four words that specifically speak to my heart and I hope speak to your heart at a time like this because they're words that describe for us the fundamental promise of Scripture, which is the ability and the willingness of God to put things right after they've gone wrong. 
Now, before I go to Psalm 23 and quote King David in these four words, let me tell you a story from my early days as a parent. Now, as you know, I love, love being a parent. Now, I've been a parent a long, long time because I'm an old man. But uh, I love being a parent for young children particularly, and now I even have grand, grandchildren who are, uh, who are getting older. But back years ago when my daughter... Vanessa was a two-year-old, something happened that I thought so much about. And if, so if I had to go back and say, what were your favorite moments as a parent? It would be a moment that I had with our daughter, Vanessa, and it involved a balloon, kind of like this one. Now, as I recall, the balloon that day was bright blue, but little almost two-year-old Vanessa had a helium-filled balloon. Now, you know, a helium-filled balloon is... It's almost alive. It bounces. It's like a toy. A child running around playing with a helium-filled balloon is like she's she almost has a pet. She almost has a living thing. So I was watching Vanessa. She was running around playing with this balloon, and she bumped the balloon. All right, now I'm going to try this. I don't know if this will work or not. She bumped the balloon up against a sharp object, and it popped the balloon. Wow. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> what we won't do for chapel illustrations. Now, here's what happens to that bright, bouncy, almost alive balloon when it pops. It becomes a kind of a miserable looking little shred of rubber, absolutely useless. It in no way resembles the balloon that it was a moment ago. Now, here's the part that I loved about this story. My little girl, because she was a little girl, and because she thought like a child, and because she innocently and naively believed her dad could do anything, when her balloon popped, it, she didn't start crying. She didn't go crazy. She just reached down and picked that balloon up, and she put it in her hand, and she brought it over to me, and she reached it out to me and said, here, Daddy, fix it. Fix it. <laughs> well, I'll tell you why that's so sweet, because Daddy can't fix a busted balloon. When a balloon is busted, it's busted. But a little girl doesn't know that. A little girl just brings it to Daddy and says, here, fix it. Now, that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to turn to Him as our Heavenly Father when things are broken and not get logical, not overthink this thing, just like a little child. Give it to Him and say, Here, Father, will you please fix it? Scripture tells us, come to Him as a little child. Scripture talks to us about this Father who can be all things, give all things, do all things. And here we find ourselves in the middle of a humongous mess, a crisis that everyone is sharing all around the globe. And that crisis becomes a part of my life and a part of your life. You're suffering because of it. Your family's suffering because of it. We back here on campus are suffering because of it. It's a problem so big that it can't be adequately addressed just by human beings working as hard as they will. And those are exactly the kind of problems God, our Heavenly Father, wants us to bring to Him like little children and say, Here, Lord, will you fix this? Now, a lot of us are hurting right now, and we've got a lot of our dreams kind of blown up in the air. We don't know where they're going to come down. But this is a time for us to remember that we have a God who restores to us those things that are blown away. And that's what brings me to David. David and the 23rd Psalm. Everybody could repeat this for me. Uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Everybody knows that famous psalm. Four words in the middle of that psalm I want to point you to this morning. David says, He restores my soul. He restores my soul. And what those four words in David's beautiful psalm remind me 
is that God is in the business of restoring the things that we think are gone, we think are lost. He restores my soul. It's springtime. And you know what the lesson of spring is? The lesson of spring is sometimes when things look dead, seem dead, feel dead, they're not really dead. They're just dormant. And it's dormant because when wintertime comes and the leaves fall off the trees and all the, everything gets very dead looking and in many places the snow comes and covers it up, the ice and shrubbery and trees and plants look totally dead. But we've been around long enough to know they're not dead. They're just dormant. But the life is still in those plants and when spring comes, they become alive again. You know, one more, one more little thing here. I, this, is, this is a twig off of a shrub out in my front yard. I broke this little limb off when I came in today to do this. And what it shows is, you know, it's a stick like, you know, look this, you take this, you break it off. It's dusty, it's dry, it's like it's dead. But this thing looks totally dead. But already in the springtime, the life started to come back up in this thing. Here's, here's how the next branch looked. Starting to get leaves again. Starting to get little buds again. Spring is the season when we are reminded that things aren't dead. They're just dormant. And that's what David reminds us of in this scripture. He says, God restores. He restores my soul. <clears throat> now, you know, David knew what he was talking about. On the one hand, David was the biggest superstar in the Old Testament. He was a superstar. He had everything. He was nice looking. He was a poet and a, and a lyricist. He wrote great poems and songs. He was a musician. He was a warrior. He, 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 was a, he had the whole package. He was a man's man who also had the heart of a, of a sentimental nurturing, feeling person. And he was the king of England. Uh, king of, oh Lord. I hope they can take that out. Now he was not, hey, newsflash, David was the king of England. He was the king of Israel. That's what he was the king of. <laughs> All those kings kind of run together for me, you know. He was the king of Israel. People followed him, uh, felt so strongly that he was their leader. But you know what happened with David? David lost contact with God. He betrayed his marriage. He murdered a friend so he could sleep with his wife. His son betrayed him and tried to chase him down and revolt against him. He winds up with his son dying. David went from being one of the most favored brilliantly successful superstars in the universe to being a guy whose life was totally in tatters. So when David says about God, not just God is great, God is powerful, God is mighty, God knows everything. He said all those things in other places about God. In this place, he says about God, he restores me. He restores my soul. And David could say that because he knew what it was like to feel like you've lost everything you cared about and then get it all brought back by God. He restores my soul. So these four words in the springtime from David remind us spring is about renewal. Everywhere you are, you know, the grass has gotten green again. The buds are coming out again. The shrubs are blossoming again. <laughs> Life is returning to all those things that were locked in winter. It reminds us that God is the God of renewal. He works on these great cycles of renewal. You know, it does get dark in the middle of the night, but the sun comes up in the morning. It does get cold and bare in the middle of winter, but spring brings the life back. And in all of our lives, there will be times that we're going to get battered by life. And I believe... Honestly, this is one of those times for me and it's one of those times for many of you and for many of your family members. Things got taken away from us. 
The gospel is they're going to be given back. We lost things we care deeply about. The gospel is it's all coming back. So I, I know that in your life, it's hard at a time like this to keep your joy, but your joy will come back to keep your sense that God has his hand on your life, but that sense of calling will come back. It's hard sometimes to keep that closeness with God, that sense of intimacy. Some of you, I would guess, aren't praying as much or as well or really connecting to God as closely as you might have been a month ago, two months ago, six months ago. But let me tell you, God's standing by and He wants to say to you about your spiritual connection to Him, that's not dead. It's just dormant. And it's coming back. I'm going to restore to you everything that you've lost. David wasn't the only one that experienced this in Scripture. We see lots of other examples. If you like a New Testament example, think about Peter. Peter was close to the Lord, walked by, by his side, was very much a part of the whole ministry of Christ, and suddenly finds himself having betrayed God and weeping and and with his, with his Lord seeming to be dead. But what happened in the life of Peter? Everything he had, everything he loved, everything he cared about was restored to him. Why? It was never dead to start with. It was just dormant. So I want to tell you that all those things in your life, your joy, your dreams, your innocence, your relationship, your energy and commitment toward your calling is not dead. It's just dormant. Let me remind you that Satan's greatest lie for us is when it's gone, it's gone. Satan would like you to think that these good things you enjoyed as a child of God are like Kleenex. You know, use them up and throw them away. God doesn't use you up and throw you away. No, it's more like a, it's like your cell phone. It's rechargeable. You plug it in the wall and it comes back fully restored. The energy has come back. You're not disposable to God and your connection and commitment to God doesn't die. So if it's dormant right now, I want you to just remember the words of David in the springtime. He restores your soul. God knows that we get beat up and worn out and sometimes empty. And when we do, he says, just keep the faith, stay connected to me because your life with me is not dead. I am still in you, working in you to both will and to do according to my great pleasure. I wish I could be right there where you are right now, six feet away, of course. I mean, honestly, I just wish I could be sitting in your living room or somewhere and talk with you personally. I'd gladly take the time to talk with every one of you personally. God puts you really deep inside my heart and I'm hurting for you. You're disappointed and I'm disappointed for you and with you. But I do believe that the message of God, it comes to us in such a powerful way that we can believe it and hang on to it is what he began in our life, he will be faithful to complete it. Amen. Amen. So hang in there, guys. Zoom on. Stay in touch with us. And I'll be in back in touch with you next week. Let me offer a final prayer. Thank you, Lord, for these my sons and daughters, my brothers and sisters. Hold them close. Never let them go. And show them, oh God, how strongly you are at work in their lives, even now, in Christ's name, amen. Okay, it's not chapel without the college benediction, so pray it with me. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Amen.